Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank the organisers for accepting my presentation at this uh, remote or virtual meeting. And it's great to be able to talk to you all, despite these awful times we have at the moment with COVID. Today, I'm going to speak to you about the six month outcomes from the high intensity focused ultrasound closure technique we're using for incompetent saphenous veins and also incompetent perforating veins. As everyone in this audience is aware, the endovenous techniques really came in at the end of the 1990s to replace previous open surgery. And it wasn't until about a decade later that people started looking for alternatives, such as the non-thermal, non-tumescent sublations, moco, glue. People did also look at foam, but as we know, in truncal veins, this isn't a great option, although it's, of course, essential in smaller veins and more peripheral veins. In the 1990s, however, there was this move away from an endovenous approach towards a completely non-invasive approach using high-intensity focused ultrasound or echotherapy. This is illustrated here in this diagram showing a, the principles of endovenous thermal ablation. The endovenous catheter is passed up the great saphenous vein in this example from a position of the lowest point of reflux, which in this diagram is just below the knee. The catheter is passed up to the top of the vein, in this case the saphenofemoral junction, and tumescent anesthesia, the most painful part of the procedure, is then injected around the saphenous vein. The tumescence not only gives some anaesthesia, but also causes constriction of the vein onto the catheter itself, which helps with uh, keeping any blood out of it and giving good thermal contact. And of course, it also pushes any tissue away, giving a third benefit of tumescence. So one of the major advantages of endovenous thermal ablation is the lack of neovascularization because of this fibrotic reaction. And we've checked this and published our results at both one year with radiofrequency and also 15 years when looking specifically for any neovascular tissue in the groin, there was none to be found at any time point. Not surprisingly, when you think of the minimally invasive way that this is performed, the quick return to work, the lack of any substantial pain, as well as the excellent long-term results and no neovascular tissue, the endovenous thermal ablation techniques have now become the first line technique for treating or ablating truncal reflux in America, in the European guidelines and in the NICE guidelines from the UK. Most people are now coming to understand that for an endovenous ablative technique to work, the whole of the vein wall has to be killed. This is, as we've shown previously, by a process of either necrosis or apoptosis. There are still some people who think it's an endothelial action um, and sticking the vein together, but this has really been shown to not be the case as endothelial damage ends up with thrombosis. And if any of the medial or adventitial cells are still alive at the end of the process, the cannulation rates are very high. So we know that transmural death is required to get full ablation from any of these techniques. This is demonstrated in a book I wrote recently on leg ulcer treatments, where if you look on the left hand side, there's a diagram of a truncal vein. If we follow the top sequence, first of all, where whatever process has been used only damages the intima without damaging the whole of the wall, leaving the media alive in the adventitia. We first of all get a thrombus, which is often called a closure of the vein, only get a late recanalization. And that recanalization, of course, is going to reflux. And this is why we see in so many uh, series, if the catheter uh, ablation technique has not been done adequately, or indeed foam sclerotherapy has been done in a large vein, we often see a closure rate that decreases with follow-up over the years. If, however, we follow the bottom route, if we have transmural death, and so therefore we've killed the cells all the way from endothelium out to adventitia, we end up with a fibrotic occlusion, which in the short term looks more or less the same as the intraluminal thrombus, but of course the vein slowly shrivels away, and over a year or so you get complete involution, and the vein can't even be seen. And this is a permanent ablation or fibrotic closure. 
So now moving away from catheter-based thermal ablation, I want to now look at high-intensity focused ultrasound or echotherapy. And the machine that we've been using is the Sonovane, and we call it now the Sonovane 1, as I'll explain later, because this was originally designed to be used for the treatment and ablation of breast tumours and thyroid tumours. But we've turned around and used this for the ablation of truncal veins and perforators. So the next couple of diagrams are going to explain how the HIFU works. This first diagram shows a cartoon on the left hand side of the HIFU head and shows the first of the ultrasounds, the grayscale ultrasound being activated. And on the right hand side, what is seen by the grayscale ultrasound. Right in the middle of the picture, you can see the great sphenous vein constricted with a small amount of local anaesthetic around it. We don't always use local anaesthetic, but in this case, there's a good amount of targeted local anaesthetic directly around the great sphinx vein. This diagram shows what happens when we then fire the high intensity focus ultrasound. The second part or the dome shape vibrates, giving this conical ultrasound, heating the target area represented here as little red dot to about 90 degrees centigrade. On the right hand side, we can see this as a reflection of bubbles that are formed as this white cross in the middle of the screen with black either side where there is no bubbles being formed. At the end of treatment, the ablated tissue has got lots of little bubbles in it, which last for a minute or two. And we can see that there's been a good ablation here of the great sphenous vein. Using the same sort of diagram that I used before, on the left hand side here, a normal great sphenous vein, we're now causing transmural death, but this time rather from an endovenous approach, we're using this from the focused ultrasound externally. But as you can see, the energy is still transmural, and so therefore, provided we give the right amount of energy, we will st still get fibrosis and therefore involution, and we'll get a permanent closure of the vein. So because of COVID, we have incomplete follow-up of all of the patients we've treated, and we also had some disruption to the service. However, 47 patients have been treated at the time of the abstract submission, and 22 had attended for the six to eight week scan and also for the six month scan. The mean age of those attending for all of the scans was 55.5 years with the range as you can see, and predominantly female more than male. This slide just shows the uh, presentation of the patients. Most of the patients were actually for C3 disease or edema, with just one patient for thread veins with underlying reflux, almost as many for C2 or normal varicose veins, and just three patients with skin damage for C4. In this group of patients, 34 incompetent perforators were treated and 11 truncal veins. And the 11 truncal veins had four great saphenous veins within them, which were five to nine millimeters, four small saphenous veins, which were seven to 10 millimeters, and three anterior accessory saphenous veins between three and seven millimeters. So this is a life table analysis looking at both the truncal veins and the perforating veins. And of those patients who have come back over the six to eight weeks and also the six months, outside of our learning curve, we've found 100% so far of ablations of truncal veins and 82% of the perforated veins remain closed at six months. And as you can see, the perforators that did open all opened within six to eight weeks. Therefore, in conclusion, at six months using HIFU, using the Sonovane 1 machine, we found that despite the COVID restrictions, we've managed to get enough patients back to say that really the truncal vein ablation seems to be pretty good, 100% so far. Incompetent perforator veins, 82%, which is the same that we see with the Trollope technique and also the same that we see from SEPs in most series that have been published, which are both comparable at this six month stage with endovenous thermal ablations. However, the most exciting is yet to come. So over the next month or so, we're going to get the echotherapy was on a vein two. And this is a machine that's been designed specifically for the treatment of veins. It's going to have a different power profile and the early results suggest that this will be able to treat veins with absolutely no local anesthetic at all. A lot of the criticisms with Sonovane 1 has been that the targeted local anesthetic 
is not a huge difference from a little bit of tumescence. But this new technique is likely to completely revolutionize the whole of the process by making local anesthetic hopefully completely and utterly not needed anymore. And we hope to be presenting our results on the first few treatments of this early in 2021. Thank you very much for your attention.